heaven. We're nearing the end of our study. We'll talk about hell next week, talking about heaven uh, this morning. Uh, just a couple of things before we get into the uh, outline. I um, want to clear up something from last week that I, I have a habit of doing, just so you all know. Um, uh, I visited with one brother. Um, okay, when I get statistics, <laughs> I'm just throwing things out there as an example. Okay, So, like when it comes to the to the Holy Spirit issue and the brotherhood, personal or literal, I always say it's about 50-50. I, that's just a guesstimate on the people that I know. Um, so when I'm saying something like that, just, you know, when I say 99%, I don't know if it's 99 that's an exaggeration. So um, that did confuse a couple folks, and so I wanted to uh, clear that up. It's just hyperbolic, really, is what it is. So... Um, I don't know if anybody knows all the statistics that are on that. Um, the, the other thing was, um, when we're talking about those three heavens, in fact, if you want to turn over to Revelation chapter 19, we're going to be there in just a minute. Um, when we talked about those three heavens, that is, that's not a, a modern day breakdown of the heavens. As you notice from the scripture verses that were given, that's the understanding that's always been there from day one. God committed, uh, God created the firmament. There's, he made a separation between the heaven where he dwells, the heaven uh, outer space where the stars and moons are, and then the heavens where you and I live in the atmosphere. So that's not something that's new to us. Uh, the reason why I, I mentioned that is because I talked about Sheol. That's the Jews don't believe in hell like Christians do. Okay, that's the first thing you got to realize. So their their theology on that is different. Of course, they don't accept Christ as the Savior. So Christ talks about the the um, afterlife for Christians, and of course, they're not going to believe that. But their Old Testament concept of she, of, of what happens when you die is Sheol. Okay, and that for us would be the equivalent of Gehenna, or excuse me, not Gehenna, uh, of Hades, the Hadean realm we would kind of make a correlation there between those two. And where I confuse people is I said in the Old Testament, or I didn't say in the Old Testament, I said the Jews had a concept, and you remember this, where the sun goes down, remember, into the ground, okay? They would say that the sun went to Sheol, and then all night long there's this big battle, big fight, and then the sun prevails and it comes up on the other side, okay? So that was their concept of where a person goes. They bury a person in the ground. They put a person in a tomb. Where does that person go? They go into Sheol, that realm of the of the dead. Okay. Some uh, religious leaders believed in re, in uh, re, reincarnation. Some believed in uh, the fact that people would go on and experience an afterlife. They kind of had different views. But when I was saying that, I didn't mean to imply because that's not the concept we have today, of course. But I didn't mean to imply that the three heavens was a new concept that we have under the Christian dispensation. It's always been that way. And uh, I forgot my lesson 10, uh, lesson 9 down there on the three heavens. So those ones show you that the three heavens have always existed. Okay? It's not a Christian perspective only. Um, they've always existed. And then we got into the third heaven. We talked about the heaven of heavens or the heaven where God dwelled. And that's what we're going to be um, looking at this morning. Um, heaven is mentioned 500, this is on your outline, heaven is mentioned 530 times in the Bible. Now there's more references to it. I go to prepare you a home. There's more references to heaven, but directly the word is mentioned 535 times in the Bible. That's according to Strong's Concordance. The Greek word for heaven is, is uranos. Remember, we're talking about general eschatology now. Second coming of Christ for eternity. Where is the person? Well, they're in Uranus. We're not talking about Paradisi anymore, which was in the Hades or Hades. Okay, so it's the Greek word Uranus. Um, it comes from Strong's number G three seven seven two, and it means the seat of order of things eternal. Okay? It's not a temporary abode of things eternal. Um, more specifically, where God dwells and other heavenly beings dwell. The only thing that I would add to that is, of course, where Christians 
are going to dwell. Right now, heaven is filled with these beings and angels and all of those things. We see from the book of Revelation that there's been some exemptions to people and some of the souls of individuals are in heaven now for specific purposes. You think about the souls crying out from underneath the altar of God. How long, O God, until you avenge our blood? So there are those who have been translated to heaven. Um, but when we die, we don't go to Uranus. We go to Hades. We go to the Hadean realm. Um, heaven appears from Genesis chapter 1 and verse 8, creation, all the way to Revelation 21 and verse 10. So it's, it's scattered all throughout the Bible. Um, when we get to the New Testament teachings for Christians, heaven isn't some surprise that comes on us. Um, God has been talking about the place where he dwells for, let's say the world is uh, six to 10,000 years old. We got 2,000 after um, the, the death of Christ. So we're talking 4,000 years ago. Heaven was talked about. Heaven was taught to people. So it's certainly by no means a new concept. It's, again, it's there from Genesis always to the book of Revelation. That's 6,000 years people have been talking about heaven on where it appears in the scriptures. Uh, having, if you want to go to Matthew 5, sorry, I told you to go to Revelation. Um, I meant uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 34. Matthew 5 and verse 34. It says, but I say to you, this is what we're talking about, where heaven is the place where God dwells. I put on there the Godhead. Godhead appears three times in, in scripture in the New Testament. Um, so we know that the Godhead dwells in heaven. Uh, but I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. Okay? Heaven is the place where God reigns. The throne is a symbol of authority. It's kingly. It's majesty. When you hear about Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth on her throne, you know what that means. You know that it speaks to those things that are, that are, uh, have to do with majesty and glory and honor and all those things that come with sitting on the throne. It's been that way all the way back to the pagan kings, all the way back to Israel when they wanted a king. So it's the throne where uh, God sits, that source of power and uh, authority. Heaven is also the place where Christians will go. Go over to 1 Peter. 1 Peter, look at um, chapter 1 and verse 4. Maybe I should back up. Three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. A quick little side note, that living hope is only connected with the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. That rules out all those other worldly religions who don't accept who Jesus Christ is. All right, so this is a nail in their coffin. He says this, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. Why? Because nothing temporary, nothing that defiles, nothing that is ungodly is in heaven. And this is what he's saying. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. So this again is the Greek word uranus. We're done. We're in general eschatology. We're not talking about uh, um, uh, Hades anymore. Hades. We're always talking about Uranus. So this is the promise that's given to the Christians, that they're going to be in this place. We know that heaven is where God dwells. We know that heaven is the place, according to Luke chapter 20, uh, not 24, um, Acts chapter 1, verse 11, where Christ ascended, where he's at the right hand of God, and of course the Holy Spirit is there as well. Heaven is the place where Jesus will return from. I just gave you Acts 1 and verse 11. Go over to Hebrews uh, chapter 9. In verse 24, Hebrews 9 and verse 24, and it says these words, For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. So if you remember, the temple was just a type. It's a type of the anti-type. Sometimes people get that. They think anti-type than type. The type is the original thing, the temple, the holy of holies is the type, the anti-type. And usually when we hear anti, we think opposed to, anti-Christ. But in typology, anti is in the reference of the thing that it was being alluded to. So the Holy of Holies was a type of heaven itself. The Holy of Holies in heaven 
where Christ has gone. Okay, so you have the type, the anti-type, and that's what he's talking about. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hand. He didn't rise from the dead and go to the temple. Okay, in AD 70, the temple is destroyed. It's still destroyed to this very day. You remember your uh, history of uh, Judaism. The only thing that's left standing is the Wailing Wall. It's the Western Wall, which technically isn't part of the temple proper. It's not part of the actual temple. It's a restraining wall that was built uh, beginning with Herod that circled it. But it's the closest thing to the uh, to where the temple sat. Uh, of course, today there's a Muslim mosque, a Muslim mosque that sits where the temple of God used to be. Okay, why? Because I'm telling you, uh, wherever you come down on your history, uh, the Christianity did not fare well in um, the Crusades. Of course, those were started by the Catholic Church and their doctrine, uh, but the Crusades is where Christians fought Muslims. Um, there were a few other religious groups thrown in there, but um, we lost. Uh, uh, they lost every holy place in the Crusades. And the biggest example of that, of course, is there's a mosque where the temple used to stand, all right? That's a big loss. It's an offense to the Jews to this very day. Uh, it's something that they pray will be torn down and replaced with a, another earthly temple in their theology that the Messiah will finally come to that temple. But we know there's no use for the temple because there's no mosaical law. There's no sacrifices or anything like that. So here you see, that's the reference to the holy places made with hands. That's the temple. Those are copies of the true, uh, which are in heaven. So um, you have there the reality of heaven. Um, this is a real place. People are really going to go there. Um, before we get to the second one, let's deal again with the church uh, and the new Jerusalem. Um, go over to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. This is our first reference to the church as the bride. Well, excuse me. It's not the first reference to the church as the bride. This is the first reference to the marriage of the bride to Christ. And so it says this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So you have two references here that both are referring to the church. Okay, We're talking about the church glorified. We're not talking about the church militant. The church right now is the church militant. We're fighting. We're fighting this battle. The battle's being waged against the church. There's sin and there's, there's um, goodness. There's evil and there's goodness. And that battle is taking place right now. And you are part of it. Okay, We're all part of it. Um, here we're talking about the church glorified, okay? So in verse 7, rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. How do we know that's the church? Well, go over to Ephesians. Keep your finger there in Revelation. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, beginning in verse 25. It says this, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, right, the church glorified, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. That's the very thing that was said in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7 through 9. It's the exact same thing. It's the church glorified. How is it pure and white? The blood of Jesus Christ purifies. It cleanses. The church has been purified and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. How do you know that you're part of the church? Well, you know from two verses. Acts chapter 2 and verse 20, uh, 40, 41, and the Lord added daily the saved, those who were being saved to the church. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27, now you are the body of Christ. Now you are, now 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. The church is the body of Christ. Right? So there you see the connection. We're the bride. We're the bride of Christ. Go over to 2 Corinthians. Go over to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11. 
in verse 2. For I am jealous for you, this is Paul, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousies, right into the church. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Again, that's another reference to the bride of Christ. So I've given you what? Uh, one, uh, two, three. I've given you three already so far that speak to the church as being the bride of Christ. Um, stay there in 2 Corinthians. Oh, I forgot to give you verse 32 of Ephesians. It also talks about the church being the bride of Christ. So you see the same thing here. Go over to 1 Corinthians. Oh, I gave you 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Okay, so there's a clear um, indication, a clear teaching in Scripture that the church of Christ is the bride of Christ. What you see in Revelation 19, we're going back to it if you want to turn over there, in Revelation 21, what you're seeing is the marriage of the church to Christ. It's the end times. It's, um, it's the beginning of eternity for, the, for um, Christians. It's that general eschatology. Okay? Um, look at Revelation chapter 19 again. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. So we saw how the church is the bride of Christ. Now you see that the marriage of the Lamb has come. Who's the Lamb? Blessed is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's what John said only about one person in all of his ministry. And he said it about Jesus Christ at, the, at his baptism. Okay? Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away. So the Lamb here is Christ. There's a marriage of the Lamb is taking place. And it talks about his wife. Well, clearly, again, Ephesians 5, 2 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 12, that's the church of Christ. Okay? So the church is being married to Christ because the church is the bride of Christ. And the church, through the blood of Christ, through the Lamb of Christ, has been made pure. Think about it this way. It's made a fitting bride to Christ. It's made that pure, as Paul says, without spot or without blemish. The bride is ready to be married to the bridegroom, okay? And, and you see that again all throughout these different um, illustrations that you see. Verse 8, uh, and to her it was granted, that's the wife, that's the church, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints, okay? The church militant is now the church glorified. So you get this question, hold, just, uh, just, no, go ahead. Well, he would. And Ephesians 4 takes care of that too. There's one body. There's one church of Christ. So here's the question. I don't know if you get it. I always get it. I see it online all the time. Um, and people say, oh, you church of Christ folks think you're, think you're the only ones going to heaven. Yes. Yes, that's correct. You answer that in affirmative. Yes. Yes, I believe the church of Christ is the only ones going to heaven. Now, would you like me to explain to you who the church of Christ is? The church of Christ is the saved. Acts 2 and verse 47. The church of Christ are those who are the Lamb of God. Uh, Revelation 19, 7 through 9. The church of Christ is that which is the new Jerusalem. We're going to look at that in Revelation 21. So they don't want the explanation. They just want to be able to attack us and say, oh, you think you're the only ones going to heaven. I think the church, I think the church and I think Christians are the only ones going to heaven. Now, are you a Christian? You know, how can you be a Christian if you're in a denomination, Right? Uh, well, I'll back that up. Are there Christians in denominations? Well, it's a trick They're question. Huh? They're erring. They erring. It's a trick question. Yeah, there are. They're erring. What happens if Christ comes while they're in a denomination? They're lost. They're lost. How can they be without spot and blemish? Only that which is without spot and blemish is the church of Christ. So a denomination is not going to be without spot and blemish. So, yeah, when you talk about the Church of Christ, we ain't talking about Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, Presbyterian. I don't know who's watching this online. We go out pretty far to a whole lot of people. But if you're not in the Church of Christ, no, you won't go to heaven. If you're not in the Church of Christ, no, you're not saved. If you're not in the Church of Christ, no, you will not be the bride of Christ. I'm sorry. 
The church of Christ is comprised of the saved. I've already proven that with scripture. Book, chapter, and verse. Okay, so, so yes, church, is, church of Christ is the only one that's going to heaven. Um, go over to Revelation chapter 21. And what we're doing is we're, we're building a, 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 a case here for the church. Revelation chapter 21. Um, look at verse 2 first before we go to verse 9. Uh, well, verse 1, sorry. Revelation 21, verse 1. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Not a Jehovah Witness concept. That's what they think is the earth being replenished. A new way of things, a new system. And of course, this is eternity. This is not anything that's ta ta taking place on earth. There is a, it is a new heaven, a new earth, a new way of things. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, of course. Also, there was no more sea. Sea is used all throughout the book of Revelation, and sea always speaks of separation. That's not hard for us to understand. What separates the land masses? The oceans, the seas, they separate the land masses. And so that there's also no more separation. Of course not, because the bride is going to be married to Christ. So there's not going to be a separation like there is now. Today, we're the church militant. Today, we're the bride who is yet to be uh, glorified and given to Christ, right? It says, then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to stop right there. So right there, there's a new Jerusalem. We've seen a new heaven and a new earth. So this can't be the old Jerusalem. New is your first indication that it's not the old Jerusalem. But we don't know if we stop right there what this new Jerusalem is. But we don't stop there. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's the church. The, the husband is Christ. The new Jerusalem is the church of Christ. There is no other. You can look up bride. I'll help you confine your search. Leave out bride in the Old Testament. Look at all the references to bride in the New Testament, and you will only see a bride when it comes to the church or when it comes to um, a bride adorned for her husband. You will only see that in reference to, to the church and to Christ. I, I gave you, uh, I helped you out already. Ephesians 5, 2 Corinthians 11, Ephesians 5, 32. It only speaks of the church of Christ as being the bride. So when I look at verse chapter 2 here, I know very clearly what that's talking about. The new Jerusalem that John is seeing coming down from heaven from God, this bride is the church. That's what he's saying, the church. You can go to verse 3, and I, had, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, because the church is in heaven, right, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Who is our God in the church? God. <laughs> God himself, right? Go down to verse um, uh, verse. Um, a nine, verse nine. Then you see it again. You see the new Jerusalem. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues uh, uh, came to me and talked to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Does that sound a little familiar? Sure it does. You've seen it before, right? The new Jerusalem is described as being a bride. The only thing that's being described as being a bride in the New Testament that's married to Christ is the church of Christ, okay? Okay. So I know what the New Jerusalem is. It's the church. It's the bride of Christ. Okay. Now why does that matter? Well, it matters because we're going to answer the question, who comprises that church of Christ? Who is going to be in that marriage feast? No, not everyone is going to be in the marriage feast with the bride. Not everyone is going to make it to heaven. Not everyone is going to be faithful, Revelation 2, verse 10, till death. Yes, there's going to be Christians who aren't going to make it. And you know whether or not that's you, don't you? There you go. I'm not going to live my life without knowing that I'm saved in a right relationship with church. I think it's a sad thing when a Christian says, well, I hope I'm going to heaven. Well, I want to go to heaven. If you don't know right here and right now that you're going to heaven when you die, you got some problems. I'm going to heaven. 
Am I perfect? No. But I'm going to be washed in the I'm washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Do I have spots and blemishes? Yes. But the blood of Christ takes them away. I'm not going to heaven because I'm perfect. I'm going to heaven because I'm blood bowl. So yes, I'm going to heaven. If I die today, I'm going well. If I die today, I'm going to Hades. <laughs> I'm going to Hades. But ultimately, I'm going to heaven. There's no doubt in my mind whatsoever. And there shouldn't be a doubt in your mind whatsoever. Well, you got a problem. you got to get right with God today. There's sin that's committed. There's sin that we need to confess. Like I said, I'm not going because I'm perfect. Uh, perfect. I'm not going because I'm sinless. I'm going because of my relationship with Jesus Christ. And so are you. But here's the truth. Revelation 21.10. Not everyone who says they're a Christian is going to heaven. Now, the easy thing to think about are the denominations. They're not going to heaven. And that's why we evangelize them. And that's why we engage them in debates. And that's why we say to them, we can't meet you halfway. We can't negotiate with you. Uh, you know, we, we can't, you know, agree to disagree. We want you to go where we're going. We want you to be in that marriage ceremony, the bride, the church to Christ. But if you remain in the state that you are now, you're lost. Here's the other thing. There are those within the church of Christ who are not going to go to heaven either. It's the way it is. I don't believe, having had experience with Oak Hills Church of Christ, well, they're not Oak Hills Church of Christ anymore. They're Oak Hills Church. We're Max Lucado. Max, whom I know personally. I don't believe that that Oak Hills Church, and I know I've got somebody who watches from Oak Hills Church. I don't believe you're going to heaven. Because I don't believe that's the church of Christ anymore. They've, def they've defiled themselves. There's lots. Richland Hill says they're a church of Christ. They have instrumental music and women elders. They're not going to go to heaven. The people who support that and live in that. So there are those who say they're part of the church that aren't going to go to heaven. There are those today who are faithful Christians who will become unfaithful Christians. I'm sorry. That's the way it is. That's the way it happens. Be faithful unto death. Okay, it, it happens that way. What we're going to see this morning are those who endure, those who persevere. We're getting a glimpse of the future. Remember that. John is seeing and hearing these things that are going to take place when it, when it involves the church. The seven letters have already been sent out, and that part of Revelation is fulfilled, of course. Um, but we're seeing the church in the future and what's going to happen. Okay, um, Our goal is to be in that be in that marriage feast. Well, let me give you some examples of those who are going, or, or excuse me, um, yeah, I, I need to flip it. I need to flip it. The next one is not everyone will go. Uh, jump down first to those who will go to heaven, okay? Those who will go to heaven. Those who will go to heaven, go over to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and verse 38, verse 38. Who's going to go to heaven? Those who are scripturally baptized. I didn't put those who were baptized. Because again, you have denominational people who are baptized. Those who are scripturally baptized. Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you, the gospels for every one of them, what they needed to do was for every one of them, not just a select few, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? There's one baptism, again, Ephesians 4. There's one Lord, one faith. There's one, 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 not a multiplicity. I always correct people when they say to me, I need to be baptized again. There's no such thing as being baptized again. If you weren't baptized scripturally the first time, there is no baptism. You need to be baptized for the right reason. Acts 2 and verse 38. Uh, Mark chapter 16, 15 and 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. You need to be baptized. You're baptized, one, you're baptized scripturally one time. All those other baptisms were not scriptural. They're not scriptural. Another thing that is fingers down a chalkboard to me are Bible camps where they got 20 people who get baptized during a camp session. And you know why that bothers me? Because one, it's emotionalism. I've seen it first hand. And two, because when they're 25 years old, they show up at my office knocking on my door saying, I don't think I was baptized for the right reason. Well, why don't you? Well, I did it because the, the other girls in my cabin were doing it. Or I did it because the other guys 
we're doing it. Yeah, no, you haven't been baptized scripturally. So you've lived all your time since that camp day to this very moment. You've lived all your time not being in a right relationship with God even though you thought you were. That's a terrible way to live. And there are people in the church who have not been baptized scripturally and they think they're right. I'm not going to accept Christian church baptism. That's not the church of the New Testament. I'm not going to accept it. They teach error and doctrine. How can you be baptized? You're baptized into the church. How can you be baptized into something that you're not even part of? You're not even worshiping with. You're not even serving. That's just crazy talk. That's just crazy. Okay? So we're looking at the church glorified. We're looking at those who are part of the church. Those in Revelation 21 and those in Revelation, uh, Re Revelation 19, these are the faithful people that we're talking about. Okay? We're talking about them. So you see that. Those who are scripturally baptized. Um, I gave you Revelation 2 and verse 10. Who goes to heaven? Those who remain faithful unto death. It's what we strive for. It's what we wrestle with. It's why we overcome temptations. It's why we seek repentance from God. The Christian isn't rebaptized over and over and over and over again. The, the Christian has repentance. The Christian has that right of going in the presence of God and confessing their sins because the blood of Jesus Christ has already been there for them. Okay? Repentance. So those who remain faithful are going to heaven. Um, who's going to heaven? Those whose name, names are written in the book of life. Um, go over to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. Look at verse 27. It says this, Then I saw a great... What? That's not the right one. Revelation 21. Sorry, let me get down there. 21 and verse 27. Um, but there shall by no means enter it anything um, that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Their name can be blotted out. You can fall from grace. You can fall from your place of salvation. Again, Revelation 2.10 is there as a warning. Be faithful unto death. Okay? So, so here you see who's going to heaven, those whose names are written in the book of life. If your name's not there, you're not going. I'll say it again. Denominational people are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, they can leave their denomination and embrace the truth and become New Testament Christians. I, I'm not implying that they can't do that. But those who remain in denominations, either to the, till they die or till Christ comes back, their name's not written in the Lamb's book of life. How do I know? Because the church is without spot or blemish. I already gave that to you. Because the church is, is the bride of Christ. I've already given that to you, right? Because the church are those who have been baptized, right? Those who have washed away their sins, Acts 22 and verse 16, right? So we know whose name is going to be in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? You, 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 you need to answer yes to that. I'm, t I'm going to heaven, folks. So, aren't you? Aren't you? Okay. So, those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Um, uh, go over to Galatians 3 and verse 27. It's a little bit different from Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. In Galatians 3 and verse 27, we see location. We see closeness. Um, 3 and verse 27 says this, it says, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ, notice, have put on Christ. So you cannot put on Christ unless you have been baptized into Christ. Salvation is in Christ. Salvation exists in the church of Christ. Why? It's the body of Christ. It's the bride of Christ. Okay? So here's two things that are mentioned here. You're baptized into Christ if you're baptized scripturally. Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, uh, uh, Mark 16.15, all of those things. And then if you're baptized into Christ, you've put on Christ. Okay? You've put on Christ. So those who, have, those who have fulfilled that verse are going to go to heaven. Uh, next, who's going to go to heaven? Those who are in the church of Christ, I've already given it to you, Acts 2 and verse 47. Who's going to go to, who's going to um, go to heaven? Those who confess Christ, go over to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. And I'll give you 32 and 33. They, they, they really, 
make one thought. It says, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. So hold on to verse 33 for just a second. So notice what he's talking about here. He can't be talking about those who are in a denomination. There's no way. How are those in a denomination confessing Christ? They're not even baptized into Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27. They haven't all even put on Christ. They haven't done it. Right? So there, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, that's a person who's become a New Testament Christian. Him, that Christian, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven, verse 33, but whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father is in heaven. That includes everybody whose name is not written in the Lamb's book of life. That includes everybody who is not a New Testament Christian. That includes everybody who may be confessing Christ with their mouth, but it's to no avail who are in the denominations, and maybe I should be fair, and add all those other different groups, Buddhists, Muslim, uh, uh, Muslims, uh, Jews, um, all those other groups, Hindu, Buddhists. Okay? They're the ones that are found in verse 33. Oh, Don, you're so hard and unloving. I didn't write these verses. <laughs> I, didn't write, I didn't write Acts 2 and Revelation 21 and, and Galatians 3 and, and Matthew 10. I'm just telling you what the scripture says. So you're really, the person's not mad at me. They're, they're mad at God. And they're mad because they're learning that they're not making. They're not going to go to heaven if they die today in the state in which they are. They don't have to remain in that state, but they will. I won't see my dad in heaven. My dad was not a New Testament Christian. You don't think that hurts? That hurts terribly that my dad won't be there. But God doesn't play favorites, right? I don't get to go to God and say, would you make an exemption for daddy? You know, he taught me how to throw a baseball, he taught me how to walk, he taught me how to be a man, he taught me all these things. Can you make an exception for him? And God's answer is no. No, I don't make exceptions for who's a Christian. That's a decision that you have to make. I don't make it for you. Okay? So that's hard. You know, that's hard. But it's the truth. With the exception of my mother and sister, every, every one of my other family members, if they don't um, become New Testament Christians, will be lost. My whole family's Catholic. They'll be laws. Okay? So those who uh, confess Christ are, are going to be those who, who will be in heaven. Um, Acts 22 and verse 16, I've already given you those whose sins are washed away. Baptism is, uh, washing away of sins is connected with baptism and baptism only. It is not connected with confessing. Confessing is one step in the plan of salvation. Right? Baptism is where sins are washed away. And only by, I confess Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Great. But you ain't done yet. You ain't done yet. Okay? So we see it's going to be those whose sins are washed away. And then you're in Matthew right now. Turn back to Matthew chapter 7. Uh, Matthew chapter 7. And look at verse 21. You have two groups of people. Um, verse 21, uh, Matthew, I'm in 6, Matthew 7, um, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. I got five minutes? Five minutes. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a true statement. Revelation 2 and verse 10 already taught us that. The denominations say, Lord, Lord, but they're not going to heaven. Well, how do I know? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. It's not the will of our Father in heaven that we be in a denomination. It's not the will of our Father in heaven that we submit to unscriptural baptism. It's not the will of our Father in heaven that we think as Christians we can go around and live however we want to live. No, that's not the will of our Father who's in heaven. The will is that we're faithful, obedient, repentive Christians. Christians. Again, why do I say that yes, the Church of Christ is the only one, are the only people going to heaven? Because it's filled with Christians. That's why. And if you want to go, let me teach you how to be a Christian. 
The last thing that you would have on there, we're not going to have time to go over it because I have to start with a new lesson next week. So I give them to you to look look at. Who's not going to go to heaven? Well, those who are traveling the Broadway, Matthew 7, 13. Those who are unclean, no unclean thing will enter heaven, Revelation 21, 27. Those who do not confess Christ, Luke 12 and verse 19, Matthew 10, 32. Um, those not obedient, Matthew 7 and verse 21. Those who practice unrighteousness, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Those who don't know God and refuse the gospel, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. Also those who are ignorant of the gospel. Those who abandon Christianity, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1. Those whose name is not written in the book of life, Revelation 20 and verse 15. None of those people are going to heaven. Oh, Brother Don, you're so mean because you just discounted those who've never heard the gospel. I didn't discount them. Leland, did I write 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7 through 9? I didn't write it. I'm not going to take responsibility or blame for it. I don't have to give an answer. What I know is that God takes vengeance on them that know not the gospel. Now, some of the brethren say that only refers to the Gentiles. It only refers to the Gentiles because they were the ones that knew not God. Well, then how can that be just the Gentiles when there are other people living this very day who know not the gospel? That's for God. God has decided. God has decided the purpose for that, not me. I'm not going to argue about it. I'm not going to fret over it. I want to evangelize those people, but I'm not going to be as so ignorant as to say, let's not take the gospel to people. That way they can be saved because they've never heard it. Absolutely. 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 Oh, Don, you're just being mean. You can say it if you want, but I didn't write Second Thessalonians. All right? So, anywho, those are the ones who will not be uh, going to heaven. If you're not the bride of Christ, you won't be going to heaven. If you're not in the New Jerusalem, the church, you're not. Now, I hope there's not a single person in this room that's going to find any of those things in their life. I'll say it again. You know, it, maybe some people don't want to say it because they think that they're, they're being cocky or they're being haughty to everybody when they say, yes, I'm going to heaven. We have to know that we're going to heaven. Yes, if you're a faithful Christian, you're going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. Yes. That's right. I am not, I can never be good enough to go to heaven. Absolutely 100% right. I'm not boasting because of who I am. I am boasting because of who Christ is. 100% I am. All right, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you that we've been able to open our Bibles and to study your word. We're thankful for heaven. We're thankful that, Father, we can identify those who are going. We're thankful, Father, that as faithful Christians, we're going, and we do praise you, and we look forward to that time, Father, when um, that wedding ceremony will commence and we'll be with you for all eternity. Father, may we continue to be students of your word, sound in our doctrine, Father, wanting to know your truth and your truth only. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.